YouTube and welcome to another video in my series on the Aerosoft Airbus. Here's what's in today's show. Adding a custom waypoint into a flight plan. Some of the differences between flying in Europe and flying in the USA. What to do when the Aerosoft checklists don't behave as expected. Correcting a crazy flight plan. Flex takeoff. Landing at close to maximum weight at a high altitude airport. So with all that still to come, let's head to flight planning. Today, I'll be flying a circuit at the largest airport in the USA, Denver. Denver is a huge airport covering 53 square miles. That's twice the size of Manhattan. It has six, yes, six runways, the shortest of which is over 3,600 metres long. That's 12,000 feet in old money. The longest runway is an astonishing 4,877 metres long. Put another way, that's just over three miles. Oh, and one other interesting fact. Denver is called the Mile High City because, well, it's over a mile above sea level. That should make takeoff and landing interesting especially as I'll be using flex takeoff power and landing at near maximum weight. Let's look at the flight plan. So here's a simple route that I've created in PFPX. I wanted it long enough to get an altitude above the transition level, but short enough to keep the video time down. I'm taking off from runway 17 right then heading to the southeast to the waypoint D and D. Then it's a turn to the northwest to the Kipper IAF to land again on runway 17 right. A total journey of 138 nautical miles, approximate flight time 25 minutes. PFPX calculates that I should be landing with 3.8 tonnes of fuel on board. But, because I fly with the default amount of fuel on board, I actually land with appreciably more than that at 6.2 tonnes. Should be interesting. Just before we enter the flight deck, there's one more thing to cover. I think the acute angle between my flight path and the Kipper IAF is too severe. It's a huge ask to expect a 60-tonne aircraft travelling at 210 knots to make that sort of a turn. So to smooth out the approach, I'm going to add a custom waypoint at 90 degrees to the Kipper IAF at a range of 10 nautical miles. This is a PBD waypoint, where PBD is a mnemonic standing for place, bearing, and distance. I'll show how to program this into the MCDU in the flight section of the video. One final thought. If you ever fly to Denver and need to perform a go around, your first waypoint is titled Ho Hum. There's something rather zen about that. Let's go fly. So let's fire up the Aerosoft Airbus. We'll have the A320 in United Airlines livery today. Change the current location to KDEN for Denver and select runway 17 right. For the current time and season, we'll just set that to be daytime, which will set it to be around noon. With that done, let's load up. Let's fire up the checklist and co-pilot. Flight attendants, seats for takeoff. Before takeoff checklist. So for entering in the flight plan here, we're just going to go K D E N to K D E N. Simple and straightforward. Flight number I'll just use T S T one two three. Exterior lights. On. For no good reason other than I couldn't think of a simpler one, 
Cost index will stick at 30 and our cruising flight level will be 190. With that done we can move forward to the flight planning page and we'll select our departure runway which is of course is 17 right. We're not going to select an instrument departure so we'll clear the discontinuity. Next up let's do our arrival. We'll be arriving at runway 17 right again of course using the ILS. We'll select the D and D7 star and we'll go via the Kipper waypoint. Okay, with that entered, I want to check and clear any discontinuities before going to and selecting the D and D waypoint. From here, I'm going to enter in the custom waypoint. So I enter in the place, which is Kipper, the bearing, which is 90 degrees, and the distance, which is 10 miles and put that into the next waypoint LSK. And now you can see it's entered onto the flight plan here. I'm going to enter a speed constraint for this as well of 250 knots. And that's it entered. Because I've done that, I'm going to remove some of the now unnecessary waypoints, which are PD, Go Avs and DVV, which I'll just do by using the clear button and clicking the appropriate LSK. With those done, we can get rid of the discontinuity and a quick scroll through to check to make sure we don't have any other discontinuities anywhere in our flight plan. OK, everything looks good. Time to put in the performance for our flap settings for takeoff. And that will calculate our flex temperature of 54 degrees. There's a very complicated way that that works out how much power we need, which I don't intend to go into. I've switched across the measurement for barometric pressure to inches of mercury because of course we're in the States and that's what they use over there. With that done we're about ready to go so take off the brakes, move the throttle forward to approximately 50% power just to make sure that everything's working as it should and then push forward to the flex detent. Now I've just got a simple throttle which I need to push forward. There are no detents for things like climb or flex. I simply listen for when I hear the sound of it clicking into a detent and when I get to the appropriate point I stop. So we're off the ground in good shape, waiting for the throttle reduction altitude where I'll reduce the throttle setting to climb and engage the autopilot. Climb thrust. Autopilot on. And we're in good shape. Looking out there at the um, scenery, that's the standard FTX global scenery. Uh, for the airport, I'm using standard FSX. And for the sky and clouds, I'm using Rex Soft Clouds. The after takeoff checklist. Engine hold selector. Check normal. Spoilers. Disarmed. Flaps. Check retracted. Landing gear. Gear up. Lights off. Exterior lights. 
Set off. Tax. Both on. Anti ice. Off. Tcas. Checked. Altimeter. Two nine nine two. Two nine nine two. Checked. Checklist complete. So I'm just scrolling out on the range there so that we can get a view of the route as it's been programmed in just to make sure that it matches the picture that I had in PFPX. Now because this is uh, such a short flight and because there is really no cruise level I'm going to go and program the MCDU for the approach phase early on. I've got FSX set up to use the default weather uh, which is fair weather for this trip which gives us uh, winds of 0 knots at 0 degrees or 360 degrees so that won't affect anything. Standard barometric pressure of 29.92 so it's quite easy to program this early without any concern that conditions may have changed by the time we get into land. Now the transition altitude I'm entering here is a standard transition altitude across the entire of the United States. So whereas in Europe we might be accustomed to having transition altitudes of around five or 6,000 feet for individual airports, in the States it's the same across the entire country. Seems like a great idea, uh, very sensible, there's no doubting what we should be setting the transition altitude to. However, in this video, it did present me with an interesting challenge. What I noticed was, of course, that we're hitting the transition altitude before we hit the 10,000 feet point where we do some of our normal checks with the Aerosoft Airbus. In fact, two things happen on the way down at 10,000 feet. We put the landing lights on and we engage the LS button, which you can see here on the SCU. Now because we're working slightly differently here that doesn't happen and it can throw the checklist into a bit of a uh, bit of a tailspin if you forgive the pun. And I'll talk more about that later as we get closer in towards landing. There's one other very interesting point about this flight too. The threshold altitude is 4,700 feet or so and the point at which we enter the approach is at 12,000 feet. That means we're on our approach before we've even hit 10,000 feet. As a consequence, we haven't gone through the normal routine of turning on the landing lights and engaging the landing system here. So that's going to be a bit of a problem for us and something that we'll need to work around. Uh, of course I do that in this video and I'll show you when we get to the appropriate time. So until then the next thing we're looking out for now is our top of climb which will be at 19,000 feet. Um, it will be followed almost immediately by the top of descent. For um, a little smile <laughs> while that event is occurring, take a listen to what the flight attendant calls out uh, in the background as we approach those points. Transition altitude. Barrow reference set and cross check. Check. Descent preparation checklist. Seat belt signs. 
On. Anti ice. Off. Landing information. Received. Altimeter. Standard. Error radio. Checked. Checklist complete. That still makes me laugh. I remember it when it happened um, on the second and third attempts to create this video. Uh, but it still makes me smile. So as you can see also the checklists that occurred there were very much um, the uh, cruise checklist and then the descent preparation checklist. So that's it done. We're into the descent. Initiating descent. FMA check. Radar tilt. Set below. So you may have noticed I've dialed 11,000 feet into the altimeter on the FCU up here. And that's because that's the entry altitude into the initial approach fix uh, just after we uh, go past Kipper. Next thing coming up is we'll be coming below the transition altitude again. And there's a slight change to the way the transition altitude is dealt with in my earlier videos which have all been European based so far. Transition altitude. Checked. Two nine nine, nine two. Two nine nine two. Check. Lights on. On. So there's the difference uh, right there. This time, as we've come below transition altitude, we have activated the landing lights, which is an activity we would normally do when passing 10,000 feet. Interestingly though, we don't activate the landing system. And this is one thing where, I don't know if it's um, an intentional or an accidental gap, but if we weren't aware of that, that's going to catch us out when we're on the approach because of course we want that landing system activated. I don't know what the real world procedure is here with regards to when you activate the landing light when your transition altitude is above the 10,000 feet altitude if you know or if you know somebody who knows please leave a comment below there's not an awful lot to see now and still until we get to the Kipper waypoint so I will probably 
fast forward the video now and add in some interesting music to, uh, to fill in the gap and you'll rejoin me as we approach Kippa. So here we are approaching the Kipper Waypoint at 12,000 feet and 210 knots. So turning on to the final approach now and I still haven't engaged the landing system. I'll do that now. On reflection I think that's probably best done at the transition altitude when we turn on the landing lights. So it keeps that sequence of landing lights and activating LS occurring at the same time. So as we turn on to the approach we'll get an indication shortly that the localizer has come alive. At uh, that stage, it's almost Pavlovian now that we hit the approach button. But my experience has been not to do that when we're this far out from the field. So you can see at the moment we're just under 28 miles away That's from the threshold. Uh, as advertised there, we can see the rhombus moving across the screen. And the first couple of times I've flown this approach, I've hit the approach button now to capture the localizer but when I've done that it made quite a pronounced maneuver off to the right hand side before swinging back to the left and trying to re-engage with the localizer beam. 
at this distance it's not going to be as precise as it is when we get closer anyway so I prefer to leave it a little while because our current flight plan Approach is taking us straight list. into the runway anyway. Another thing I've learned is Check. that given the option to do the approach checklist now, do it straight away. Don't wait on this approach as you'll discover as we go through it. Checked. Bearer reference. Checked. Two nine nine two. Two nine nine two. Check. Checklist complete. We're invited to manually activate the approach phase and this is absolutely the right time to do it as it will start to slow the aircraft down. At this stage, 22 miles to run, I've activated the approach phase because we're already pretty much on the localizer and it doesn't need to make any changes to our current course. The one big problem that we've got on this approach is we can't reduce speed quickly enough for a nice stable approach and landing. I guess this is due to two things. Firstly, we're at altitude. We're not used to landing at a, an airport that's a mile high. Secondly, we're very, very heavy. The aircraft is currently close to its maximum landing weight. And I guess those two things combined help to pull the aircraft down and make it difficult to get down to, in this case, our S speed, which you can see here. So what I do to get down to that speed is I deploy the speed brake. And as I get close to it, I get a caution that the speed brake is still out. And at that stage, I can remove it. Once I've got down to the S speed, we can hold that speed quite comfortably, but getting it to that speed is the important part. Again, when I've flown this approach here a couple of times before, I haven't deployed the speed brake and I simply haven't been able to get down to the S speed. As a result of that, the later stages where we drop later flaps and gear never happened. And I found myself being three miles from touchdown at flaps one and no gear deployed. The secret, such as it is, is to ensure that you hit the S speed. You may have noticed that though I deployed the speed brake, there's no indication on the PFD that I should do so. And yet it's quite common in some of our other flights that it does put up a warning to invite you to deploy the speed brake to slow the aircraft down. I'm not sure if it's deliberate that it does not do that on an approach. I'd be interested in knowing if you have an opinion or view on why we don't receive an enunciation to deploy the speed brake when clearly the aircraft cannot slow down to the speed it needs to be at without some help from us. So at this stage with 12 miles to run, everything is now looking good. We're on the localizer, we're on the glide slope, we're on the S for the speed. We're waiting now till we get to about six, five and a half miles from touchdown where the rest of the phase will go ahead. That's the rest of the landing phase will go ahead. The landing memo that we get occurs only under certain conditions some of which are that the radio altimeter is below 2,000 feet and that your aircraft's in a certain configuration. If it's not, it won't go through the final steps of the landing configuration before we land and you'll have to do those manually or perform a go around and do the procedure again. We're going to hit a small bit of turbulence again in a, a while. That would be the winds coming off the um, Rocky Mountains again, I suspect. And at this stage, you can see that the speed tape and the prediction of our speed is bouncing up and down. It's difficult at this stage to know whether to deploy the speed brake or not. In the end, I decide to do it simply because our speed seems to be increasing and increasing 
and it's very important for us to keep it down at the right speed for the rest of the processes to follow through. 2,500. And so with about six miles to run now, everything's looking good. Flaps and if we're in the right shape, we get the flaps call and then the gear and the remainder of gear the down. approach procedure. Gear down. Flaps three. B check flap three. Flaps full. B check flaps full. Landing checklist. Landing gear. Down and locked. Three greens. Ground spoilers. Checked and armed. Auto brakes. Medium. Exterior lights. On. Go around altitude. Checked. Landing memo. Checked no blue. Checklist complete. 1000. Okay, everything is looking good now. We're settling down nicely to our V approach speed of about 137 knots. We're on the localizer, we're on the glide slope, everything's looking just fine. Five hundred. And over to the right you can see the very distinctive Four. roof of Denver International Airport. Nicely modelled given this is the standard FSX installation. 100 above. Two hundred minimum. Autopilot off. Continue. 100. 70, 60, 50, 40, 30. Begin the flare 30. now. Retard, retard. Yeah. And retard. Ground spoilers. Slightly heavy on the landing, perhaps, but nice and safe. We're in good shape. Manual brakes. Auto oh, brakes off. And stopped long before the end of the runway. And given that Denver is such a huge airport, it's another opportunity for me to practice and refine my ruder pedal steering skills. After landing checklist. So that's it. Thanks very much for watching and I look forward to metaphorically meeting you in the next video.